Good evening and you are all very welcome to the NUI Galway College of Business and Law Virtual Information Evening. It's so many joining us tonight, so thank you for giving up some of your Thursday evening to be with us. I'm just going to cover some housekeeping with you before we start. Can I ask everyone to turn off their cameras, all attendees to turn off their cameras? And can I ask, um, your mics are automatically muted, so if you do want to ask a question, can I ask you to pop that into the chat function? And we will answer the question for you directly in the chat function, or we will put it to the panel of experts that are joining us tonight. So we also have our accommodation office joining us as well as our sports. So if you do have a question or a query around accommodation or maybe sports scholarships, please pop those into the chat function as well and we will answer those queries for you directly in the chat function. So the format tonight, we're going to uh, kick off with the College of Business uh, then we're going to hand over to our colleagues in Shannon College and last but not least, the School of Law will deliver their presentation to you. So uh, right now I'm going to hand over to Ashleen Lennon. Ashleen is the Marketing Manager for the College of Business and Economics and Ashleen is going to introduce her business team to you. Thanks Ashleen. Thanks Caroline and good evening everyone and delighted to be here this evening and thanks for taking time out of your busy evening to join us here this evening. I'm just going to share my slides with you here. Um, hopefully you'll be able to see those um, and start the presentation. I'm, I'm joined this evening by uh, some colleagues from um, academic colleagues, industry partner colleagues and also some students and alumni to share their experience. So firstly, just a brief introduction into the university itself. We're a top 1% university in the world according to the latest QS uh, um, world rankings. We are very proud of our graduate employability rate. You'll see that there are 98% of our graduates when they're surveyed by the HEA six months after graduating are either in employment or in further education after graduation. So that's fantastic and, and really one of the highest um, employee graduations or in, in employability rates in the country. We have 16 new buildings across campus, so we've invested 400 million euro in capital developments across our campus. So you as students will benefit from state of the art facilities and buildings. On to our school, our school of the J.E. Kearns um, School of Business and Economics. We have over 85 university partners all around the world, international universities that you can go and do your study abroad at. We've over 250 industry placement partners so um, you can do your placement and internships at. We have won the Education Awards for Best College of Business for the last two years in a row. We only started entering them two years ago and we won the 2019 and the 2020 awards. So we were thrilled and honoured to, re honored to receive those awards and very proud of that. And just recently we were awarded an Athena Swan Bronze Award. So we're the first non-STEM school in the university to be recognised for our efforts in advancing gender equality, um, inclusivity and diversity in our school. And our graduate employability rate in the Cairn School of Business and Economics is actually 98%. So we have a fantastic history um, um, and accolades there for in terms of graduate employability. So just to take, take you through our programmes and our offerings really quickly tonight, our, our main uh, flagship programme is the BCom. So some of you may be familiar with the BCom, it's um, a broad business degree where students get an introduction to all areas of business and commerce in year one. So you get that foundation in everything from accounting and economics all the way through to um, business organisation, marketing, management and so on. And then we we give you the choice to to choose your own specialization. So you you choose what you'd like to shop and drop, as the Americans call it. You you have optional modules 
and that you can choose to carry on um, with the accounting and economic side and the finance side, if that's of interest to you and piques your interest, or perhaps you prefer to maybe do HRM or business information systems, digital business. There's a, um, a very broad variety of offerings and modules, and we're very proud of that. A lot of our students come back and say that's one of the reasons they chose our offerings is because of the variety of modules on offer. So this is a fantastic degree for those of you um, that might not be sure if I want to go down and become down the road of becoming an accountant perhaps or maybe you're just interested in business you're not really sure so this will give you a fantastic foundation it's a three-year flagship program these are some of the areas that you can specialize in i've mentioned some of them already it gives you a flavor of the variety on offer and the great foundation that all students get um, in all areas of business no matter what job you'll end up working in you'll still have that insight and foundation and knowledge in and background in all areas that you can bring to the boardroom table on to our BCom global experience of so new program um, introduced probably three or four years ago now so this has expanded the BCom from a three-year program to a four-year program and in that third year you have your global experience year so that you can choose to do one semester study abroad and one semester work placement or perhaps one full year study abroad and most recently students are with COVID opting to perhaps do one year work placement so that program is sponsored by Deloitte. We have a partnership with them on that program. They offer travel bursaries during your, your global experience years, and they offer mentoring programs, insight days and uh, work placements and so on. The next program on offer, we have our Bachelor of Commerce International. So this is a program um, similar to the BCom. But in your third year, you have the Erasmus year. So it, the difference between this and the BCom Global Experience is that you will be going to the um, country that you're studying the language of. So whereas with the BCom Global Experience, we have partners all over the world, but you will be learning business through English and you, um, there'll be no requirement to study a language in the BCom Global Experience. In the BCom International, whether you choose BCom French, BCom German or BCom Spanish, you will go to either France, Germany, Austria, Spain, Mexico or Chile during your Erasmus year in year three. So fantastic opportunities and um, prospects for people with a, a, the blend and the much sought after combination of business and a language. So if anyone out there is interested in and enjoying the, their language in secondary school and they feel like they're good at it, I would definitely encourage you to keep up your languages. In Ireland, where we have more foreign direct investments than the BRIC countries in, um, combined, so we have a huge amount of multi, multinational countries, companies, setting up their um, European headquarters in Ireland and they need, you know, uh, languages and, and graduate skills with multilingual um, skills and cultural skills to operate in those European headquarters. Our next programme is the BCom La Guelga. So if you, again, if you if you have maybe Dúlsa Changa, Dúlsa Guelga, Dúlsa Tú, Jane of Moss Changa, Moss Malat and Guelga, Lan Earth and Quinny Earth and keep it up because again there's a it's a supply and demand issue if you're good at Irish and you you like business this is a great prospect there's a lot of jobs not just here in Ireland but across Europe and in the commission and so on for graduates with a combination of business and Irish another program is our BCom accounting um, for those of you that are already have some insight, perhaps you've worked or done some, have some exposure to accounting already uh, and think, OK, I really like this. You're studying it at Leave Insert and it really has piqued your interest and it incites you. So this might be the programme for you. Um, you must have studied accounting at Leave Insert um, and it has the ma maximum exemptions of any accounting programme in, uh, in any university in Ireland. So you'll see some of the, the companies mentioned there, the students do their experience and their work experience with, and there's the optional global year as well in, in third year on that programme. 
So our next program is business information systems. Huge development in this area at the moment, as you all know, with the pandemic and the digital transformation that's going on across every industry and every sector. Um, people have had no choice but to digitalize and go online. So huge growth in the demand um, for, for graduates with this combination of skills between business and IT. So everything is taught by from scratch and, and from everyone is um, starting on the same page. So don't worry that you mightn't have any background or prerequisites. None of that is required. Everything is um, everyone is at the same level coming into this program. But it's a fantastic program. It's accredited by EFMD, the global leaders in, in BIS. It's also got the global experience in it, the option to do your study abroad and work placement and some fantastic career opportunities. It was at 100% employability pre-COVID, and I have no doubt that that will continue post-COVID. So fantastic career prospects there. These are just some of our university partners. So I've mentioned the study abroad opportunities um, and work placement opportunities on all of our programs. So every program that we offer in the J. Kern School of Business and Economics has an opportunity to do a study abroad or a work placement. So these are just some of the universities that you might end up going to on your on your study abroad um, program. And then these are some of our work placement partners. There's obviously too many to name and there's some quotes there. There's a lot more information on the website if you want to go and have a look um, and check it out and read some of the testimonials from the students. But from an employer point of view, we hear from employers and industry partners all the time about how valuable this extra year is for the students in terms of their maturity and how much they can hit the ground running when they jo join an organization afterwards. So we have a, a partnership with PwC and I'm delighted to be joined here this evening by um, Neve McInerney, Senior Manager and Head of Graduate Recruitment at PwC Ireland. So PwC are our industry partner on our unique skills pathway program. So you'll see them outlined there, the skills for success, skills for business and the ICE program, the Dragon's Den um, finale in in final year so i think neve is with us if you're if you're i'm going to pass over to neve at the, um to speak a little bit about the partnership and how valuable the pwc uh, she and her colleagues find um the working with our students and our graduates and how this partnership on the skills program in particular um has helped students in the graduate recruitment so i'll pass over to you neve if you're if you're there i am hi everybody how are you um, that was really lovely, Ashing, uh, introduction. So thanks um, very much. I thought it might be useful to maybe address who PwC are. Um, I'm sure some of you are aware or might have seen the branding even maybe on our sponsorship as well for the All Stars, or maybe on, on some of the NUIG um, sponsorship. We're a professional services organization. And maybe to give a little bit of context um, to you, if somebody, if somebody you're thinking of maybe after college, I'm sure you're not thinking that far ahead yet, but if you were thinking of doing your accountancy exams or your tax exams or going into consulting, um, PwC would be an organization that you would you would join as part of your graduate program. And I also see lots of questions come in already about work placements, and absolutely we do paid uh, work placements um, as part of your college, but also summer um, internships. So I thought that would be important to give a little bit of context about who PwC are. Um, and also just to wish all of you the best of luck. I know you've got big decisions to make this year as to what colleges you go to and then what um, courses you do. And you can see NUIG have um, fantastic programs and really um, that's why we are so proud to be um, in partnership with them. But they have this unique program as part of um, your course. So when you come to college in NUIG, it's not just about the academics. Uh, it's also about your employability and giving you skills outside of the classroom. Um, to help you then get employment afterwards, but also as part of your work placement. Um, uh, it's been fantastic um, to be involved in it. And um, NUIG don't just, you know, we roll out the program and go, okay, that's it, we're done now for the, for the program. Every year they look at it, they refresh it, they come to us, especially in the current environment that we're in, and we've, we've all moved virtual to see, well, how can we deliver um, a better program to the students so that they do have those skills um, when they leave um, and join the, the workforce, uh, we really see it um, at, at interview stage. So when we see students um, come from NUIG um, to interview with us, you can see they're prepared, they have the knowledge, 
they've been in, they've been invested time has been invested um, in them uh, and then when they when they join us they can they can hit the hit the ground running a little a little bit more than maybe some of the others and um, would do I just think it's fantastic to have and um, that program ingrained and, and embedded into the actual um, structure of your of your um, of your course. And so it really does add add value um, to that. So you know we're we're delighted to be in partnership um, with NU, NUIG on it. And I just wish you all the best of luck uh, with your CEO applications um, and the and the year ahead. I know I've Patrick, one of my colleagues, is going to go through a little bit more detail um, on the work side of it. And and he would have been a student in NUI Galway as well. So I think he'll give a little bit more insights as well. But yeah, if that's if you have any questions, I'm, I'm here as well. I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Neve, as always. And yeah, that leads us nicely into our next slide around hoping that, that you guys out there can follow in the footsteps of greatness and all of our other alumni and where they've gone on to work. And we're delighted to be represented um, across loads of different industry by some of our alumni. You'll see Aubrey Dolan there. He's senior product manager with Adidas. So he designed Messi's, Messi's football boots. Um, Annette Donnelly is MD in Sony Music. Erica Fox, some of you might recognize her from our Instagram page. She's an influencer, um, a founder of Retroflame now living in New York, Gavin Duffy, sponsorship manager in Connect Rugby, and you'll see some of the, our presidents, um, President of Ireland, Michael D is one of our alumni, our own president of the university, um, Kieran O'Hogarty is one of our alumni, and the president of the Business Studies Teachers of Ireland, um, Margaret MacDonald, is also one of our alumni. So that, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and um, it brings me on nicely to the, uh, our next guest, who is um, Patrick Everson. So have I stopped sharing there? Sorry. Patrick has joined us as an alumni of the BCom Accounting Program. He's also studied the MAC program at NUI Galway, and now he's working in audit in the PwC office here in Galway, specializing in asset management and investment funds. So Patrick, if you're there and can turn on your camera and your mic, and perhaps if you can just share some of your experience as an alumni with us, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, can you hear me actually okay? Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, hi, everyone. So good evening. Uh, it's kind of hard to follow in greatness after showing those people. Um, but anyways, I'll do my best. Uh, so yeah, so as Ashman was saying, um, if us, firstly, my name is Patrick. Um, I'm a graduate of the BCom Accounting Program at NUI Galway. And also I did an MAC, which is a master's program in accounting at Galway as well. So I suppose the first thing just to say is why did I choose accounting? Because I know a lot of you are coming up with that decision of what found in your CAO form. So for me, I had an interest in numbers um, and I had a very strong interest in business. So naturally, um, the natural progression was going to be towards accounting. Um, I suppose I suppose from when I, when I was looking at courses and why I chose NUI Galway specifically, um, I was very intrigued by the class size. Um, so I really enjoyed the smaller types of class sizes that we have um, at that uh, NUI Galway offer on the BCom accounting program. Uh, the class sizes are around average about 35 people. Um, and I actually like that small interaction. You get to know a lot, of, you get to know the lecturers, you get a lot of interaction um, with your peers as well. Um, and there's also, there's also leads to a lot of group work and you gen genuinely become um, a very close uh, and well-knit class. Um, so then, because I can see an awful lot of the questions coming through, so in my third year of study, um, I actually did a work, I did um, a year, uh, sorry, a half year abroad. So I went to upstate New York in Buffalo um, for the first four months to December, um, and I went to college over there. So I studied for four months, and then when I came back to Ireland in January, um, I was lucky enough to receive um, a, a, an internship at PwC for six months um, in the Dublin office. So I went there for six months in PwC, had a great time, um, and then eventually got offered um, a full-time contract, um, full-time graduate contract from PwC um, with a sponsored master's program as well. Um, so PwC and, uh, and offer um, sponsored master's program where basically um, there's, there's supports throughout the master's program um, in the form of monetary supports and also um, in, in the form of um, workshops and various items like that. Um, so I suppose, because I can see again some of the questions that come through. So in terms of the subject, so obviously in the BCom accounting, the only kind of prerequisite is that your accounting knowledge, um, could, your accounting knowledge it should be pretty high. I think it's a, I think it's a, in the old system, it was a C1 um, that you needed, a minimum of a C1 to get in. Um, but this was back in the day. So 
uh, I know the point system has changed. And then um, the other side of it then that in the first, the only difference between the BCom accounting and the BCom is that in the first year, um, the accounting modules are a little bit more um, difficult than compared to the normal commerce modules. But in general, um, the BCom accounting class and most of the other modules, you'll be in the same class, um, you'll be in the same classes uh, with all the other commerce students as well. Um, so that's the only difference. And then obviously, as you progress into the years, you would specialize specifically into accounting and um, giving your degree. So then just to mention on the work side then, so I went into PwC uh, two years ago now, so uh, yeah, it feels like, like a long time. And um, yeah, as Ashley was saying, I work in the audit side um, in, the, in, in the Galway office um, in PwC. So we have a reasonably new office as of last year. Um, it's a fantastic company to work for, really positive. Um, and also there's fantastic opportunities in there um, to not only, not only improve yourself as an accountant, but also to explore uh, other areas of interest. So, for example, um, I'm currently working with BWC UK um, on talking with um, developing consultant clients that we would have, for example, some uh, English Premier League football clubs. And we also have uh, other clients like rugby clients as well. So there's consultancy work in that. So basically going in and liaising with the accountant bodies in there. So that's very interesting. Um, and then the other side of it as well, that when you get into PwC, if you're, if you, this, I know this is a very strong follow on, but if you want to become if you're thinking, all right, that I want to be an accountant, uh, PwC um, will, uh, as part of the graduate contract, um, pay for your professional qualifications as well um, for your ACA qualifications of accounting. Um, so I recently qualified from that. So woohoo. Um, so I think that's I think that's generally it. As I said, NUI Galway couldn't recommend it more highly. A fantastic college lecture is absolutely brilliant, very knowledgeable, uh, really approachable. And as I said, the class size for me as part of the become accountant um, was the big kind of game changer for me. And uh, yeah, I love my five years there, and I wish I could go back. <laughs> Thanks so much, Patrick. And it's fantastic here in this peer to peer review because we hear different tidbits and different stories from different students and alumni. So it's really important, you know, to share your voice and for the students to hear from your perspective. So thanks so much for joining us this evening. And we're next joined by Megan Shocknessy, who's a fourth year BCom international student. So Megan is studying BCom with French at the moment, and she's just returned. She did her uh, Erasmus year last year in Toulouse. So Megan, if you're there, if you can turn on your camera and your mic. Um, yeah. I understand, Megan, you. that you, you actually studied um, marketing Devine or wine marketing at uh, Toulouse Business School. So I'm sure we'd all be interested in hearing how that went on your Erasmus year. <laughs> thanks a million, Ashing. thanks. And I hope you're all keeping well. Um, so as Ashing introduced me there, I'm in the final year, so I'm studying the BCom International with French. And I actually, I picked this course, I always knew I wanted to go down the accountancy route, but um, I wasn't too sure like that, I wasn't 100%, so I didn't want to confine myself to a four-year course just in case it didn't suit me. So I thought, I'll do the BCom, I'll increase my skills, my language skills, and I'll get a general consensus of, you know, is the accounting for me or not? So I decided to pick the BCom of French and I went to France last year. So I was in Toulouse, I was studying wine marketing. And then with the BCom, you'll study economics, um, economics, information systems and marketing. So a lot of subjects I wouldn't have really been exposed to if I didn't choose or if I had chosen the BCom with accounting. And then in second year, I decided I wanted to apply for um, internships. So I applied for a few and luckily I did an internship in the tax department in EY in Galway. So I spent 12 weeks there last summer before I went to France and they offered me a grad contract. So I'm going there back there in September in 2021. Um, and it's great to know that in final year that you're going into a grad program but I would emphasize as well I know a lot of people are asking do you get work placement with this co with this course or um, is that available I think if it's something you want to do you're able to do it so I didn't have the opportunity for a work placement with the BCom in French and um, I just had the opportunity of studying abroad and it was fantastic and I wouldn't change a thing like I had the time in my life in France and the wine marketing was something I'd never get a chance to study in Ireland um, so I wouldn't change the fact that I was denied, not denied a work places, but that I didn't get to do one. Because, um, yeah, if it's something you want to do, you can do it. And I wouldn't let 
that change your decision, even with the the three year the um the three year course as well. If you were thinking not to go for it because there's no work placement, um, it's something I wouldn't um worry about because if you do want to get a work placement, it's possible. Um, there's a lot a lot of companies out there who do um internships for for um for students, and um yeah, I think that's everything for me but I I love my time in college I'm going to be so sad when it's all over um it was the time of my life so yeah it was a great time you can stay with us like Megan like Patrick did and, and just do your master's and it's only one more year and you have your master's under your belt so don't go anywhere no I would I have that contract from September so like that they're covering my I have the ACA exams and then I'll have tax exams as well I'll have another two years um yeah, I'm nice. Think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Great, brilliant. And our last student of the evening and alumni of the evening is uh, Gareth Davy. So, Gareth, if you can turn on your camera, Gareth completed the BCom degree and is now undertaking a master's in marketing practice. Um, so, Gareth's going to share his experience. If you are there, Gareth, to take off um, or unmute yourself. Yep. Yeah, can you hear me there, Ashley? Great. Thanks, William Gareth. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, brilliant. Thanks for having me tonight. So, um, yeah, unlike, say, Patrick or Megan, that I didn't really have a, um, I wasn't sure exactly why I wanted to go down in business. I did business for my leaving cert, but I wasn't exactly sure if I wanted to specialise in anything. I didn't do accounting or economics or that, but I knew I wanted to study business. Um, so I chose the BCom General, GY201, the three-year degree, and that gave me uh, the fundamentals. It taught me the fundamentals of business in first year. And in my second year, which was great because it really allowed me to kind of discover what side of business I loved. And um, so as I progressed through my degree, um, I found that I had a love for marketing and it was just great. Um, as well as that, actually, I should mention that um, in first and second, year, like I said, I just did uh, business, but I didn't do accounting or economics for my leaving cert. But in first year, when I got taught accounting and economics, they're taught from scratch which was very, very helpful for me to understand those fundamentals. And I wasn't at a disadvantage for not uh, learning them at Leaving Cert. So as I said, I progressed through my degree and I found I had a love for marketing and um, the, I was able to specialize that in my final year. And um, it was just great. There was a uh, core subjects of marketing in my final year were very, very great, very, very approachable. And as well as that, there was diverse subjects I could choose for um, that really helped me uh, tune my degree that way I liked it so I always had a a, a I always liked say tech, uh, technology and all that so my final year as well as doing core marketing subjects I was able to do a optional subject of uh, web design which I very much enjoyed and really helped impair my degree and while I was and I know some people in the chat have been asking you know is there a disadvantage from doing the three year rather than work placement but um, while I was in my second year um, I was I had the knowledge kind of fresh in my head doing all that. I just really wanted to get back into final year. So I decided to go straight into uh, final year there. And I had the idea of doing a master's already in second year by one of the school talks that the uh, school uh, organized. And so now in four years, I'll be able to have my undergrad and my master's in the four years. So it really is no disadvantage doing say, the three year course compared to a four year course. Um, and that's basically, yeah, that's kind of me up to now. Fantastic. Thanks, Gareth. And um, just while we're kind of have a panel discussion between yourself and Patrick and Megan and Neve, just I was thinking about um, student societies and sports clubs and how important that is for Neve and employers to see that you guys have built your your digital brand, let's say, and building your your CV all the time, not just in the classroom, Neve touching it, but outside the classroom by joining sports and, and clubs and societies. Um, uh, I know we've like over 150 different sports clubs and societies. So I don't know if any of you students want to share. Did you join um, societies or any clubs or anything that you did with the Career Development Centre? Did you get an employability badge or anything like that that helped um, your digital brand and build your own CV that you'd like to share with the students and give them a heads up on? I might come in on that, Ashley. Uh... Sure. So yes, yeah, so it's Patrick. Um, yeah, so just in college, I think one thing that's really good because I, I think sometimes um, is the whole aspect of volunteering. Um, so NUI Galway offered the Alive program um, for volunteering. So basically it's a, it's a, it's a certificate which you get um, on the basis of so many hours that you do for volunteering. It's actually a very nice, as a, well, 
there was a ceremony before and I'm sure there'll be a ceremony in the future pre-COVID but um, it'll, uh, it's, it's very good just to get out and uh, anyone who's interested in volunteering I highly recommend getting involved in that. Yeah, uh, I could as well go on that as well. That um, I was, I was definitely no athlete and never will be, unfortunately. But um, I was able to help out in volunteering and all that. So I actually became a, a ambassador of the a school ambassador while I was throughout my degree. So I was able to help out in events that were going on in the business school throughout the year and all that. And it was just great to kind of get the foot in the door and kind of see how everything works in business and all that. And that really has stood out to me. And when I did an interview for uh, my master's place, they were asked about that and my role and that. So it really did stay with me and all that so it really was great to just kind of get involved with that. Um, I got involved with the LI program as well actually I volunteered with Madra and um, so they're a charity if you don't know they're a charity in Galway they help with dogs and find dogs homes pretty much um, so I worked in their shop at the weekends volunteered in their shop and if they had a fun run and um, I'd help out Stuart at that so it was a great opportunity as well to get involved in Fantastic and well done to you all. I think it's great to develop those skills and ne even networking skills outside of the classroom as well. You never know who you're going to meet through a student society or a sports club. Michael D, he was um, president of the Literary and Debating Society while he was a student here. So and look at him now. So you just don't know the skills that you're going to pick up and the networks that you'll meet. And, and Neve from PwC, I don't know if you want to make a comment on that. Um, it, how important is that what, when you're going through um, the milk run and the graduate recruitment cycle, looking at students and what they've done outside the classroom? Because you, you might get a lot of students graduating with the same um, degree award. So it must be very difficult for you guys to um, distinguish and, and um, um, set students apart. So I'm sure you look at things like that outside of the classroom. Yeah, absolutely. And it kind of comes back to that balance piece to be able to show that that they can balance and prioritize and plan and or organize themselves. And um, because that's what they'll be doing when, when they come and join us. But also students think that because they're not involved in society or they're not a captain of whatever team it is, that they're not doing something. And what I'd always say to someone is, what's your thing? So what are you interested? What are you interested in? And uh, whether it's sport, music, pottery, um, part time jobs, whatever it is, it's just about having an interest in something and kind of following that, following that through. And um, you're bringing me, you're bringing me back to the times when I played hockey in college. And actually, my first year was into varsities in Galway, and uh, we had an absolute ball. And, and it is, it's, it's networking as well. It's getting to meet new people all the time. Um, and then, like the sport isn't your thing. If you're actually really into the finance side of thing, I know we also sponsor the Finance Society um, in NUI Galway. And they have fantastic um, events and um, skills sessions as well themselves that they do and have different industries, not just us, just as we sponsor them. It's not solely PwC. They do have other, and I know as part of your skills program as well, you have vast, um, I'm going to say on your books, a vast, uh, vast network of, uh, of industries. And it is, it's about that network. And, and especially if you are in that virtual environment, you have to kind of be a bit innovative on how you, how you can network and how you can meet um, new people. So yeah, what's your thing? And trying to get that get that across, I think that's probably the biggest thing I'd, I'd say to people. It doesn't have to be what everybody else is doing. It just, it just has to be what you're interested in and being able to articulate that and, and, and include it on your CV or application form really helps you stand out. Great. Thanks, Neve. And another thing employers feed back to us, and you've mentioned it in the past as well, is because our campus is so diverse and the students are mixing with different students from all over the world and different cultures, that um, it helps in this global world that we're now living and working in, that every industry is global in their outlook. So that those cross-cultural awareness skills are developed on campus through mixing uh, um, with the student societies and the different international students and so on, um, that students are, get, get a flavor and get introduced to different cultural norms early on in their in their student life. And they, they bring this into their to their work life with them. And they um, there's less of a learning curve than when they're working in, in a global setting. So there's multiple benefits to becoming a, or joining us in NUI Galway and becoming one of the NUI Galway students. I think we've covered all of our speakers. I know um, 
Dr. Joanna Clancy is with us tonight as well. I see you're really busy there in the chat. She's the program um, uh, program director, the BCOM. I'm not sure, Joanna, if you have anything else to add or is there anything I've missed? I know you're flat out answering the questions there as I've been moderating the presenters. Um, but if there's anything I've missed or anything you want to add from an academic point of view, feel yeah. free. I think we've covered nearly everything, I think. I think, I think everything's covered, Ashlyn. Thanks for the introduction and thanks to all our speakers. Um, you've represented our course very well and thanks to Neve as well for coming on for PwC. Uh, there's nothing more really that I can add there, Ashling, only really to address some of the questions that have been asked here in the chat. The main questions being about transferring from BCom to BCom Global, uh, the difference between the courses, um, you know, will students be at a disadvantage if they haven't studied business subjects coming into a commerce degree? And no, you won't. So if you haven't studied business or accounting or economics, uh, for the leading search, you won't be at a disadvantage because there's plenty of help. Everybody starts on the same page um, and there are plenty of tutorials and everything that will help you catch up um, and do your best. So don't worry about that. Uh, there are no requirements there. And then for transfer from the BCom to the BCom Global, uh, we have a number of places every year. This changes every year and it changes based on what the academic requirements are. So usually it's around uh, a low two one, but this can change. And why it changes is based on the demand for the programme and also how many placements that we can secure with our, our partners, with our employers. Um, this could be challenging going forward based on the unique circumstances that we're facing and everybody's facing. Uh, but I can't make a call on that as to how many places will be available or what the minimum grade will be. Uh, but it will be a minimum of a 2-1 most definitely to get onto the course, which is not difficult to get. It's absolutely not impossible, which is what, what one of the questions was, uh, if you study hard. So no more than anything, a 2-1 is very achievable once you do your best. Um, I'm trying to think, were there any other questions? Uh, I, it was mainly in relation to, you know, can or the questions that you've had here in the chat um, in the three year programme, can you do placement and study abroad? No, you can't do it in the regular three year programme. Uh, you'd need to be on the four year programme to do that. But there are internships available, um, like our, our friends here from PwC have said, there are internships available for summertime as well, that you could make the most of those if you're on the three year programme. So don't worry about that. Um, and of course, we have other employers as well that that um, that take on interns. So I think that's it really, Ashling. Um, well done to everybody for, for coming on and helping us out and to all our guests here as well. Um, if you need any more information, if there's anything that I haven't answered or our team haven't answered tonight, by all means, get in touch with us. And as we always say, no question is is silly. So whatever the question is, be sure to to reach out and, and we can help. OK, I think that's it, Ashling. Great. Great. Thanks so much, Joanna. And coming back to the question Thanks. about the transferring, because we, we get that uh, all the time. Um, and I suppose in NUI Galway, we try and be as flexible and as accommodating as, as possible. So if you really want the BCom Global, but let's say you were um, just really disappointed and didn't get the points and but have the BCom down, because if you get the BCom, you can make up for it in year one, as Joanna said. So entry to transfer over to the BCom Global is on a competitive basis, but it, it happens every year. I think on average, Joanna, around six to students transfer it, as, as Joanna said it depends on supply and demand how many places we have we are growing our inter, uh, international university partners every year so there's more and more of them coming on stream so we cannot guarantee and say yes you'll definitely be able to transfer over it depends uh, year on year on the cohort and on your grades but there is yeah, a backup just, option just to come in there yeah exactly so there is the option um the, the option to transfer and as Ashling said make sure that you do put if your heart is set on BCom Global, make sure that you do put down the BCom as well with this transfer opportunity. Um, Ashley, you said that we have about 60 placements around that, yeah, around 60 places every year for BCom transfers into BCom Global. Uh, that's not guaranteed. So this number of 60 um, could fluctuate next year. So we're not promising there will be that amount of places. But in general, we have that amount of places. And once you meet the academic requirement that's set out each year, you will get a place once you meet the requirement um, that's been set. 
Exactly. Yeah. So make sure and put those um, the BCom uh, after the BCom Global on your CAO form. Um, and as I, as we both said, you know there are opportunities. It's hard to predict the future, but that's the normal uh, amount of, of students that transfer every year. Um, so I think that covers all of the normal questions. There's still a lot of questions coming through in the chat, so I'll try and get back to them now. We might uh, finish up there a little early. Sorry, Caroline, I flew through the presentation because I was so conscious I didn't want to delay my colleagues in Shannon and Law, but we've actually finished now ahead of schedule. So um, I hope that doesn't mess up the, the schedule for Helena now and, and, and Law, but I think that covers everything from our side. Um, if you want to... We, we'll get back to the, some questions now in the chat and if you want to go ahead with Shannon, great. is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Ashleen. Um, yeah, so just to remind you that, you know, accommodation is online with us here tonight, as is sport. So if you do have questions around accommodation in Galway, you know, please pop them into the chat function. And likewise, maybe you are interested in applying for a sports scholarship at the university. Then again, pop those questions into the chat function because uh, Teresa and Ryan are only uh, too delighted to answer those questions for you. So I'm going to head over to to our colleagues in Shannon, uh, to Helena. Helena is online there and she's going to give you the presentation for Shannon College. Thanks, Helena. Sorry, Helena, you just need to unmute. Sorry about that. <laughs> Perfect. Can everybody see my screen? Oh, we can. Yeah, you, you know, you just need to share with us, I would say, Helena. Yeah. Sorry so, about that. I thought yeah, I no, had that's that. Okay. No worries. I'll just wait until you have it up and running and I'll let you know once we Thank can see it. Thank you very it. much. No worries. Is that working there, Caroline? Um, no, not coming up yet. Okay. Sorry about this, guys. Um, Ashley, just make sure you've stopped sharing, maybe, because sometimes if you possibly have, but. Yeah, I've stopped sharing, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. Sharing. Okay, sorry. Sorry about this, guys. That's okay. Okay, I'm actually, do you know what I'm, uh, sorry about this guys, I'm actually after sharing the wrong presentation. My, it's actually, I've just shared the wrong presentation. Is this one uh, presenting now, the Shannon College one? Yeah, sorry. Shannon College, yeah, we can see sorry, this Sorry guys, Yeah. I think I need to go to NUI Galway and study some computer knowledge um, before <laughs> I start the next time. So absolutely, so sorry about that guys and a warm welcome to you all and thank you very much for joining this evening. Um, my name is Helena Doody and I'm the School Liaison Officer with the Shannon College of Hotel Management. And also tonight I'm going to be joined by the lovely Maeve McDonald, one of our student ambassadors, who's going to talk to you a little bit um, about internship opportunities at the college. So we're located in the lovely County Clare and we're a college of the College of Business, Public Policy and Law and we joined the university in 2015. But students that are studying at Shannon College will be based um, down in Shannon and that's where you will, will study. So just to tell you a little bit about the programmes that we have in Shannon, um, we have two level A programmes. So we have the Bachelor of Business Studies in International Hotel Management, and then we also have a Bachelor of Commerce in International Hotel Management. So I suppose the beauty of these programmes is you're studying your business or commerce degree, but you're also studying your hotel management qualification also. So this gives you, I suppose, um, a varied career. You know, if you decide after maybe 10, 15 years, you don't want to stay in the hospitality industry, you still have that very solid business degree as well, which will open a lot of doors for you. And over half of our graduates will diversify into some other business area after a number of years. So I suppose the college in Shannon and, and the programmes in Shannon are a little bit different, I suppose, than other programmes in that there's a huge amount of professional practical training takes place in first year. And a huge part of our programme also is all students will have 21 months of paid internship throughout the programmes. And you will get the opportunity to travel abroad for a full year in your second year to Europe. And then you have an international work placement at the end of the programme. So we can guarantee you your job at the end of your four years, we set you up in your first job. Um, and again, I suppose as part of the programme, 
in year one, it you know, just to, do, to go through briefly the program, first year in Shannon is made up of a lot of different areas. You'll do a lot of practical training, um, you'll do languages, and you'll also then start your business subjects. So in the first year of the program, it's very, very practical orientated, I suppose. You know, if you're going to work in a hotel and be a hotel manager, you can't do this from a book. You have to practically learn. So in the college itself, we have a full front um, and that's where you'll do a lot of your practical training in first year. So you spend five weeks in five different practical training um, areas. So, for example, you spend five weeks in restaurant practical where you will learn everything from the basics of carrying two plates to running a restaurant. Because when you go on your internship in second year, you're going to be working at a lot of five star properties, which will have Michelin star restaurants. And we need to have you up to a certain level. So you learn all the different styles of restaurant service, full um, all about wines and spirits, full barista training. And um, then in the kitchen, you're going to spend five weeks there as well. Now, we're not training you to be a chef, OK, in your five weeks, but we do want you to have an appreciation of, I suppose, how a kitchen works. So you're going to learn everything from food preparation, cost control. And as a group of students, you're going to prepare a three course meal with two, cho three choices for all the guests in the restaurant every day. So it's very much real life. The students in the restaurant are welcoming guests, taking orders. You in the kitchen are going to get that food ready and it works like a full, fully functioning hotel and fully functioning restaurant and kitchen. You'll also learn a lot about accommodation services. So working in the accommodation department of a hotel and you'll do a lot of practical training in, in a lot of our partner properties like Adair Manor, Dromole and Castle, all located very near us. And you'll actually get out into the properties and see how it all works. Again, you'll study front office and you'll study skills for work life, all these practical areas. So every day in first year, from half nine until three o'clock, you're actually in practical work. Now, as well as that, you will start your, your business subjects. So you're going to study management, accountancy, economics, all those areas as well in first year. And you will study languages. It's very, very important part of the program in first year. You'll study French, German, Spanish or intercultural communications because that will really depict where you're going to go on your internet or in your European placement in second year, your paid placement, which I'm not going to talk a lot about because the lovely Maeve is going to, to fill you in on her experience. But just even to have a look at the picture there, that's some of the amazing properties um, that our students work in for their 12 months. So they're immersed into the hotel. They get a, a huge experience, great in their CV, and again, great to improve their language skills. Um, in total then, when you come back into third year, all students again, um, whether you're studying the BBS or the BCom, will study the majority will be the same subjects. The only real difference um, will be the BBS students, the Bachelor of Business Studies, will study, um, they will study business skills development and law, and the BCom students will study maths and they will study economics. So they're the only differences there um, between the BBS and the BCom in third year. And again, in the summer of third year, a lot of our students will take the opportunity to go abroad, work for the summer, either in America, and we have an arrangement with the Seychelles government that 15 of our students get to go to the Seychelles Islands on that summer between year three and four, just again to gain more experience and have that opportunity and build your CV. Um, in the final year then, the BBS students stay on the Shannon campus and you study general business subjects here like entrepreneurship, strategy, um, international human resource management. And you get to choose a lot of different hospitality electives because these might be areas you have a, a keen interest in. Um, but also, I suppose it allows you maybe think about these going forward for maybe what job opportunities or what departments you want to work for in the future. So you'll see there are a lot of different electives from asset management to event management, public speaking, facilities management, all those areas. Now, if you're studying the commerce degree, you'll go up to the lovely campus in NUI Galway and you'll see Joanna Clancy, who is on, will look after you when you go up. Um, and at this stage, then our, our commerce students choose one particular discipline um, to focus on. So they join the final year of the BCom class in Galway and choose one particular um, business discipline that you'll see there, everything from marketing to economics and public policy, digital business and analytics. Um, while students are in their final year, I suppose this is where we organise um, their first job for them. So in the final year of your, your college, um, what will happen is we invite all the hotel companies actually fly into Shannon College, will come on campus to recruit students. So by the time you get to your final year, you'll have a pretty good idea of, I suppose, what country you want to go to, maybe what particular hotel group you want to work for and in what position. So when the companies come every year, for example, we would have Four Seasons, Marriott, Ritz-Carlton, all the big hotel brands will come on site. 
some years there will be direct hire um, positions, some will be training management positions for maybe one to two years. And at this stage, it's up to you where you want to go and what company you want to work for. But I suppose by the time all the students get to their final exams or before their final exams in year four, they have their contract signed, they have their job offers and they're ready to, to head out into the working world. And they graduate the following March, then after a nine month internship. Um, to take a look at where some of our students are on their final internships, you'll see they're, they're all over the world from Canada, Hong Kong, Abu Dhabi, Seychelles, and of course, some are in fantastic properties here in Ireland as well. And we're very lucky to work with over 100 different, 130 different hotels across 17 countries worldwide. Um, and a huge alumni network there. A lot of, you know, general managers of five-star properties and big hotel chains are, are Shannon alumni. And they come back year on year constantly to recruit our students, which is fantastic to have. And again, in Ireland, we're very lucky. A lot of the five-star properties in Ireland um, are managed by Shannon graduates, for example, Adair Manor Resort, the, which has been named the best resort in Europe, you know, the Intercontinental Hotel in Dublin. Um, and again, looking at the president of the Irish Hotels Federation at the moment, the new CEO of Fall to Ireland, they're all graduates of Shannon College of Hotel Management. So certainly they will nurture you, they will help you. And that constant, I, support, I suppose, support for jobs going forward is why we have a 100% employment record at the college. Um, just very quickly to look at entry requirements, because sometimes when students see the points for Shannon, they get a little bit weary um, and they think, my God, how, how is that possible? But our um, points there, you'll see the BBS and the BCom, they're actually a combination of interview points and leaving cert points put together. So once you apply through CAO, whether it be in February or late applications in May or change your mind in July, you're called for an interview, which is literally a 10, 15 minute interview. Nothing scary. It's not there to catch you out. It's there to get to know you a little bit, make sure you're aware of, of what the programme entails and a great opportunity to pick up points as well. So those points, when you see them, don't get a fright. Um, they're a combination of your interview points and leaving cert points put together. Now, we also have um, a virtual open evening on November 26th, where all our students are going to be online and running the event for us. Um, so Maeve will be very busy again on that night. Um, so you're more than welcome. If you pop onto our website, you can register for that event as well. Um, and look, depending on what way things go in January and restrictions, we're hoping to have um, maybe one on one visits to the campus. If you do want to come down, have a look around, talk to students, we'll organise appointments for you and show you around. Um, I know that's kind of the whistle stop, stop tour of Shannon College. Um, apologies for my technical difficulties at the beginning. I shall try harder for the next time and practice more. Um, but thank you very much. If you have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat box. I'll be more than happy to take them. And I'm actually going to pass you over um, to Maeve MacDonald, one of our third year student ambassadors at Shannon College, who's going to talk to you um, a little bit about um, placements in Shannon College and how all that works. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm also going to just attempt to share my screen. Um, one second now. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, brilliant. OK, uh, good evening. My name is Maeve MacDonald and as Helena said, I'm a third year student in Shannon College and I'm just going to uh, talk to you about the second year placement that Shannon offers. So it's a 12 month placement and um, it is paid. However, it uh, it varies with where you go. Some hotels offer accommodation um, in the hotel and then some uh, some hotels offer um, kind of more money and then you get your own accommodation. So it does vary. Um, so it depends what language you're studying on where you go. So I was studying French, so I was in Brussels, but it also you could go to Paris, Switzerland, Luxembourg. Um, if you're studying German, you go to Germany and and etc. So um, the I think it's so important that um, in this year abroad that the professional growth. Um, I don't know if anyone watches any YouTubers, but there's one it's called the Yes Theory and what their motto is, is to seek discomfort. So um, I was a bit apprehensive before going into Shannon College because I knew that the placement was compulsory in second year. So um, and it's also a placement with your language. And when I was in school, my French wasn't great. So I was very apprehensive. But then in first year, 
all the lecturers give you so much help and guidance that it's actually so fine. And I think one of the, the things you have to do is sometimes challenge yourself. So uh, I'm so glad I did it. It was definitely one of the best years of my life. And I really do. I really did enjoy it. I know that's kind of cringy, but anyway, it was one. It really was one of the best years. And I know talking from other students as well, how much they loved it. Um, the, the, the year away gives you amazing opportunities and ones that you, you really wouldn't get anywhere else. For example, uh, on my placement, I was offered a supervising role. So I was a, a housekeeping manager, housekeeping supervisor even. But um, but I had a team and I was able to manage them and um, and it was a great experience. And I know sometimes you're looking for a job and it, it often says you need a year experience or two years experience. And Shannon gives you that while at college so that when you go to, to get a job in the future, you've already have that experience so, so you can put it on your CV. So it just says enhance your CV there. Um, so prof uh, personal growth. So during the year, um, there's a lot of socialising. I know it, you are working um, and it's usually five days a week. So on your days off, you can travel. I travelled all over Europe. So I was in Brussels. So it was very easy to hop on a bus. There's flicks around Europe. I know if you've ever gone um, in trailing, you'd know. They're like 14 euro and it got me to the Netherlands, Germany, France, wherever. And it was really handy. It was a great experience. Um, you learn the new culture, obviously living in a different in a different country. You have to kind of embrace it, you know, the music, the the food, everything. And uh, I think that was kind of a shock because I just assumed everywhere in Europe would kind of be the same. But living away was it really opened my eyes to a lot more and um, to run your own household. So you are given um, um, your wage after your work or whatever. And you're also getting the Erasmus grant. We're very lucky that our uh, college put all our names forward forward for the Erasmus so um so you have to budget yourself and you have to you know cook your own dinners and do all of that and it's a great opportunity it's a really 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 great way to mature and uh so balancing work and socializing it's a great thing to like life skill to so finally I just have some photos of some of us on placement um I so top left there I worked in the kitchen in the Marriott, which was a steakhouse. So I started, I was there for three months. And in the first few days, I was all I was doing was placing croissants on a, on a plate. And it wasn't very exciting. But by the end of my three months, I was actually cooking steaks for a steakhouse, which I think was a great uh, honor uh, to be given that responsibility. Um, some people work in Michelin star uh, restaurants. I know one of my friends served Cardi B and there's so many other uh, famous people that they've served. And uh, it just kind of depends where you are, but everyone gets so much skills and so, such a different experience. It really is an amazing opportunity and I couldn't recommend Shannon College more. So that's all I have. And I'll, if there's any questions, pop them into the chat there and I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Maeve. Thanks so much, Maeve. And as I said, if, if anyone has any questions for, for Maeve or myself, please feel free to, to pop them in the chat box. Thank you very much. Thanks, Selena, and thanks, Maeve. I always love listening to the Shannon College students because they always have such interesting stories to tell about the different celebs that they have served and uh, cleaned bedrooms, etc. First, so it's always an interesting story that they have to share with us. So thanks, May, for joining us, and thanks, Selena, for giving us uh, your insights on the courses in Shannon. So I'm now going to hand you over to Lisa Doran, and Lisa is the marketing officer for the School of Law, and uh, Lisa is going to introduce the law team that she has with her tonight. So thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Caroline. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lisa, and I am the Marketing and Student Recruitment Officer at the School of Law. Um, so you're all very welcome to the information session for our law courses. And the for format of this information session is a short presentation. And once the presentation is over, we'll have a Q&A session. And we have a range of um, experts on hand who are going to help with our Q&A session. And I'll introduce you to them a little bit um, later. But in the meantime, if you've any questions, you can start popping them into the chat. And I'd now like to hand you over to Dr. Connor Hanley, 
who is a lecturer in the School of Law, and he's going to begin today's presentation on our law courses at NUI Galway. How are you doing, uh, Lisa? Uh, like pretty much everybody else, I think I'm I'm having issues with them um, with the slideshow. Uh, can you um, see me first and foremost? I can, and if you like, um, I can upload the slides if here you now. Wouldn't mind, uh, for some reason, uh, it's not coming up on my uh, open tray. Uh, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, no problem. So apologies uh, for this. Um, the, I, I'm uh, my name is Connor Hanley. Um, I'm a lecturer in the law school, obviously not in the IT section, um, but I, I specialize in teaching criminal law. So uh, I'm not going to talk about criminal law today. I, I'm, instead, I'm going to introduce you to uh, the study of law and also the study of law at NUI Galway. Um, I'm going to try to answer very briefly three, three questions. One is why you might consider studying law. Uh, some of you may already have decided to study law, but some of you, I imagine, are are thinking about alternatives, and that that's great. You should be. So I, I'll give you a couple of reasons why you might want to study law. Secondly, I want to talk about uh, why you might study law at NUI Galway, and then um, thirdly, um, I, I want to talk about how we teach law. And then I'm going to hand over to Mary, who's going to tell you a little bit more about um, one of our new programs, the degree in law and taxation. So the first question, uh, the, the, the first issue, I suppose it's a, an overriding point, is um, NUI Galway School of Law itself. Uh, whenever you go to college, wherever you go to college, you want to make sure that you're getting a good return on the, the time, effort and money that you're going to expend. And you want a degree from an institution that will stand up wherever you go. And I, I'm just giving you just on the slide on the screen, um, you'll see that, that we have been recognized both, both nationally and globally for uh, what we do at NUI Galway School of Law. We're ranked in the top 100 uh, in the world, uh, 85, number 85 in the world. We were named um, Law School of the Year last year. These kinds of accolades, they're obviously very nice for us, but they're important for you because they indicate the kind of quality that you can expect when you study at NUI Galway School of Law. OK, and that, that's an important point. Uh, a, a degree in, from us will take you wherever you want to go. I know this for a fact myself because I'm a graduate of this uh, School of Law and I had the opportunity to study at Yale University based on the degree that I got here. So that's an important point to keep in mind. Can we move on to the next slide, Lisa? So why study law? Well, we got three. I'm going to give you three reasons. The first is that it's, a, it's an absolutely fascinating kind of uh, area to think about. Uh, the level of intellectual stimulation is amazing. Secondly, personal knowledge. And thirdly, career possibilities. So we'll look at these uh, each in turn, starting with the first one. Uh, new slide, please, Lisa. OK, so in terms of intellectual stimulation, the kind of issues that lawyers have to grapple with, that law students have to grapple with, uh, are, are incredibly fraught and incredibly difficult. Uh, there are issues where there, there are multiple opinions, often very uh, deeply held opinions. And I, I've given some indications on this slide here. The issue of assisted suicide is recently before the doll. Uh, we've had a referenda on abortion and, and same sex marriage. Issues uh, like cloning and stem cell research. Sooner or later, they're going to be addressed through law and lawyers are going to lead the debate on both sides. Uh, another example, a uh, new slide, please, Lisa. Uh, another example, the current controversy is over hate speech, whether or not we should legally prohibit hate speech or should we come down on the side of protecting people's right to speak their mind, even if others find it deeply offensive. That's an ongoing issue. It's one that I, I address in criminal law. It's one that my colleagues address in the context of constitutional law. And it's one that's going to run and run and run Attitudes tend to swing from one side to a bad to another and then back again. And they, they provoke deep arguments uh, among our students and indeed among my colleagues 
uh, about what the, the position of the law should be, what the position of the state should be. And you as students will be introduced to these kinds of arguments when you're studying here. Uh, they'll start from in first year, in fact, when you take constitutional law, you will look at issues like this. Next slide, please. That's the first point. So it's, it's intellectually fascinating. But it's also incredibly useful on, on just on a personal level. If I were to say to you how if I were to ask you how many of you have ever made legally binding contracts, I suspect a large number would probably say, no, I, I, I've never had a, a legally binding contract. I'm too young. I, I'm in school, or as the case may be. That's not true. The truth is that you make legally binding contracts every single day. Every time you buy a bag of potatoes, salt and vinegar, obviously, none of that cheese and onion nonsense. You buy a bag of salt and vinegar potato, you are making a legally binding contract. You buy a Mars bar, you're making a legally, a legally binding contract. Sorry, Connor. Sorry to interrupt you, Connor. There is a reason the screen isn't sharing for everybody. Oh. So I'm just wondering, Lisa, could you maybe stop and, and just reshare maybe from that slide that Connor is currently on, no if problem. you don't mind? Uh, Thanks, Lisa. Okay. Thank you. Stop. Sorry, no, give, Connor. Give me, Sorry. Thanks, Connor. No, not at all. Thanks, yeah. Caroline. Thanks for pointing that out. We're on slide six there, Lisa. Hopefully um, they're loading now, so hopefully this time they will move um, for people. Um, so I'm just going to flick through them, they're still loading. So um, if someone can maybe pop in the chat if the slides have moved for them, hopefully they have. They have, okay, that, yeah, that's, that's good. good. So thank okay, you so much. Cool. OK, uh, so uh, the, the point that I'm getting at is that we engage with the law every day on multiple occasions, and that engagement will only grow as you get older. You will at some point, probably in the not too distant future, come to vote, which is a highly uh, legally and constitutionally regulated activity. Many of you might be driving already. If you're not, you will be you will be soon. Driving is incredibly regulated by law. You will buy a house, you will rent an apartment. All of these are, are uh, legal situations in which you're engaging with the law. And I think it, it, it makes a pretty good sense to have a good knowledge of how this law thing works and have a knowledge of how the legal system works just for your own benefit, even if you don't work in the law, even if you do something completely non-law related just to have that knowledge. And indeed, many employers who are not involved directly in the law like the idea of hiring somebody who has legal knowledge. So on a personal level, this is a really good law. It's a really good degree, a really good discipline to have behind you. Can we get the next slide there, Lisa, please? And thirdly, careers. Uh, there, it, it's it's often felt that if you get a law degree, you're going to be a solicitor or barrister. That's your career path. And certainly many of our graduates do qualify professionally and they do go into practice. But please understand that, that a law degree opens up a, a, an enormous variety of avenues for you. As I said, the law is everywhere. The whole of our, our lives, our country, our society is being regulated by law which means a knowledge of the law is useful in a variety of different sectors. And this slide here gives you an indication of just how varied uh, the, the career opportunities for somebody with a law degree can be. Uh, obviously, you have the professional route, but you can go into the public sector uh, in, in a variety of government departments. Um, Large companies tend to have graduate training programs. They look for really good people from a variety of different backgrounds. You can go into accountancy, banking, taxation. My first job after graduating from NUIG was in an insurance company. I spent five years in the claims department of the Eagle Star Insurance Company. Great, great fun. Got a tremendous exposure to the to the legal system uh, and and to how the judicial process actually works in practice. 
you can become an academic, as I did, uh, engage in legal research, and you can go outside the country. Law degrees travel really well, better than you might think, particularly within English speaking countries, because we all come from a common law family of, of legal systems. So your career options with a law degree are enormous. Please don't think that a law degree equals solicitor or barrister only. It's, it's so much more varied than that. OK, I'm often asked by, by students, what are the attributes for a good law student? Uh, you, would, I, would I make a good lawyer, do you think? And there's no, there's no template here. There's no template. Lawyers come from a variety of different backgrounds. Some of them don't even have law degrees, incidentally, including our current chief justice. He's a mathematician by training. But all lawyers, I think, would agree that, that the following, following three attributes are, are really useful. Firstly, a love of reading. Uh, this, is, this is really important. A love of language, in fact, might be, it might be more accurate. Law is about language. It's about using language to persuade and to argue, to present a particular perspective, perhaps to a judge, perhaps to a client, maybe to negotiate with, with the opposition, a variety of contexts. You must really enjoy using language, especially reading, because there is a ton of reading to be done, and there's no point dressing that up. There's an awful lot of reading to be done in order to get through a law degree. Similarly, communication. That's a, it's part and parcel of the use of language. You're communicating your knowledge, your perspective, your point of view. You're communicating your client's case, and you must do so effectively both orally and uh, in writing. So a love of reading, love of writing, and you should ideally be, have some level of comfort with public speaking because you are going to be called upon to speak in public at some point. So those are the three main attributes, I, I think, th that would indicate a lawyer in the making. I'm also sometimes asked about school subjects. Are there particular subjects you should take in school? And the answer is no, not really. Every sub, whatever subjects you take are going to bring something to the table. As I said, our chief justice is a mathematician by training. You mightn't think that there's a whole lot of overlap between law and maths. Actually, there is, because mathematics teaches logical thought, which is obviously going to be very useful. Other subjects like history require a, a great deal of reading and assimilating a great deal of information and constructing a, a, a perspective from all that information. So every subject brings something to the table. So take the subjects that you like, take the subjects that you're good at, and, and they will all help benefit you as a lawyer in some way. Uh, next slide there, Lisa, please. So. I'm going to move on now to the next point, which is uh, you, why you should uh, think about us uh, studying law in, in Galway. And what we're trying to do with all of our programs, which I'll come to in, in, in just a second, in all of our programs, we're trying to create a person or equip our, our students, not only with a good knowledge of the law, a good knowledge of how the legal system works, but also with a range of skills. They're, they're often referred to as transferable skills because they can be used in a variety of different contexts, not just in a law setting. So we're going to we will teach our, our graduates how to research effectively. They will get a great deal of experience in analyzing problems in solving problems. They'll develop their writing communication skills and they'll be able to synthesize and, and put together a huge amount of information and to extract from that the points that they need to present an effective argument. These are the kind of skills we aim to equip all of our graduates with, in addition to a thorough knowledge of the law. So how do we do this? Well, it starts by you picking out the program that best suits you. And on the screen there, you, you, you see the, the range of options that we, we have. Um, the I guess the core law degree is the law BCL program. That's a, a, a law program. It's designed for people who want to study law 
possibly with a language, which I'll come on to, but basically it's a law on its own. And then we have a number of varieties of law mixed with human rights, making use of the, the tremendous knowledge of human rights that exists in our law school. You may know that the Irish Centre for Human Rights is part of our school. Uh, we have a, a newly launched programme in, in law criminology and criminal justice, uh, a programme in law and business, and a programme in law and taxation, which Mary will, will talk about in a few minutes. But we also have another uh, variety of ways of studying law within a broader context. You can take law through the BA programme, as I did. Uh, my degree is in law and history, uh, or through the BA government programme, or through the BCom. Uh, that, that was uh, talked about earlier, and there's also BA and human rights. So we have something here to suit everybody. I should stress that the, the, the first five, the law programs, these are the programs offered by the law school, they are all full law degrees. Uh, anybody, any student who takes one of those programs will cover all of the uh, subjects required professionally to become a solicitor or barrister. It's just that some of them have a leaning in a certain direction. So the Law and Human Rights program is a full law degree, but with a leaning towards human rights. Law and Business is a full law program, but with a leaning towards business and so on. So there's something there for everybody to suit whatever taste, whatever career plans you might have. Your task, of course, is to pick the one that is, is best for you. Now, how do we develop the skills? Well, we have, uh, alone amongst all the law schools in, in this country, we have restructured our programs completely to put skills right at the heart. And we start in year one. Literally from the day you walk in the door, we start building and, and laying the foundation for, for the development of your skills. You will not study any law for the first few weeks. You'll be building the, the, the basic uh, building blocks of skills, and then you'll start studying law about uh, four weeks into the program. These are the basics of research, of writing, um, speaking, um, communication in general. We're, we're just, in first year, we're just trying to lay a foundation. Some students will have uh, experience in, in research, in writing, speaking, and so on. Others won't. We aim to have a situation by which the end of the year, every student will have a, a good foundation in these skills, which in year two, in which all students are required to take a, a program in mooting. Some of you may have come, come across mooting before. It's basically a pretend court case, okay? It's a pretend court case in which students act like lawyers. They're given a problem. They have to identify the issues, research the law, and make or written and oral arguments, sometimes in front of a real judge. We have had high court judges sit down and, and act as the, the uh, judge in our moot courts. It's quite an experience, let me tell you. Year three, we want students to go abroad to get a much broader perspective, either through work placement or through study abroad. And then they come back. They shape their degree by picking a specialism if they want to, and by uh, completing a guided research essay, which basically brings together all of the skills that have been developed over the previous three years. Next slide there, Lisa, please. Should say that in all of our programs, you have the option to take a, a language as part of your degree. It's not, it's not an add-on, it's not something you do outside the program, it's part of the program built into it. Uh, you see the, the language options, uh, they differ according to the program. You should also say that you're not obligated to take a language. Okay, you, you can if you want to, if it fits your career plans. The options are there. Next slide there, Lisa, please. I mentioned study abroad. We have options all over the world. Uh, we have a long-standing commitment to the Erasmus program throughout Europe. Um, if you're taking a, a, a European language, we would expect you to spend year three in the country whose language you're studying. But even if you're not taking a, a, a modern European language, that doesn't rule out uh, study abroad in Europe. And a number of these countries offer programs taught through English. Or maybe you're interested in going a little uh, further afield, maybe to the US or to Canada, to Australia. How about China? There's a, an exciting prospect, spending a year in China. Imagine how that looks on your CV. 
when an, a, a potential employer looks at this and, and sees that you spent a year in China, that you speak Mandarin, at least to a basic level, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that makes you stand out, that these are tremendous opportunities. Uh, I didn't take the opportunity to study abroad when I was a student here, and I regret that bitterly. I was lucky I got a second chance and I got to study in the US uh, later on in life. But I really do regret not taking the opportunity to study abroad. It, it was a very short-sighted decision on my part. So learn from my mistakes. Uh, next slide there, Lisa. My final slide, uh, I'll be handing over to Mary after this. You'll be glad to know you won't have to listen to me anymore. Uh, it concerns placement. The alternative to, to study abroad is a work placement where you get to see the law in practice. You see the law close up. You see what lawyers really do, how the law really works. And the placements can be with a variety of different um, employers. You'll see there, there are a number of law firms mentioned, Good Bodies, Barrick, Matheson, Fry's, uh, uh, RTJ. But there are, there are also other opportunities, right? Deloitte, for example, or maybe an NGO like the Irish Refugee Council, or may even in a, a state department, such as the Department of, of uh, Justice and Equality. There's a range of these, uh, these possibilities available. We try very hard to, make, uh, to, to match the, the student with the, with, with the placement. Um, and this is, a, this is a tremendous opportunity. Many of these uh, placements, incidentally, are paid. Not all of them. We can't guarantee it, but many of them are paid as well. So that's a very quick run through the law school. Uh, I'm going to stop talking now and give you all a break from me. And I'm going to hand over to Mary, who's going to talk to you about one of our new programs, which is the degree in law and taxation. Thank you for your attention. Much appreciated. Sorry for the delay there, folks. Um, my computer's a little slow and I mute, unmuted and then muted myself again. Hopefully you can hear me OK. Um, I was I hadn't seen Connor's slides in advance, so I was nodding away to some of that. <laughs> like Connor, I'm a graduate, a law graduate of it was UCG in my time, but now NUI Galway. And I actually did it through the BCom. And I deeply, deeply regret not taking the opportunity when I was in college to go study abroad. So absolutely, it's the one big regret I have about my college days. And I loved my college days. But please think now and talk to your parents about by working out how you can fit that in and do, your, do the four year degree and take that uh, opportunity if you can. So I've been given five minutes to talk about how wonderful the world of tax is, which isn't anywhere near enough time. But the, the law and taxation degree is a new one. And really, ta well, taxation is the overlap between accounting and law. And as I said, I came through the BCom. I qualified as an accountant. I did a law degree afterwards. I qualified as an accountant, but law is my first love and only love. And um, Account, taxation is that mix. It involves numbers, but tax is law. And with the law and taxation degree, as Connor said, you're doing a law degree. You're coming out with the base, the requirements needed if you're going to go on to qualify as a solicitor or as a barrister. But effectively, you've chosen early on to specialise in taxation. Uh, Lisa, if you'd hop on to the next slide. Great, thank you. So why would you, at this point, decide to specialise so early and I would say with kind of all the degrees we have on offer across the school if you're not sure about something pick the general route and keep your options open but if you already know you have a strong interest in a particular area it's great to get really stuck into that early and taxation as I said it's that sort of overlap between law and accounting you might be thinking this is taxation is something that relates more to companies and it means I'm going to be dealing with multinational businesses and the corporate world and not necessarily. Um, you may not yet think of yourself as a taxpayer, but when you bought those salt and vinegar crisps Connor mentioned that entered you into a contract, you will also have paid VAT on that and that's tax. You were all taxpayers and tax is intertwined in all of our lives from those purchases we made the salt and vinegar um, crisps to corporates decide of paying large amounts of tax or if you're apple perhaps not paying large amounts of tax 
to the business who's selling you the goods determining what rate of tax they should be applying. And some of you might have noticed that there was a court case, a Supreme Court case, very recently in Ireland, which got worldwide attention about whether or not the bread used by Subway was bread for VAT purposes. And it turned out it wasn't. They used far too much sugar. So the joke was, as is most things this year, it was even the Subway sandwiches were a cake. So tax is involved very much in businesses, but individuals' lives as well. And then our income tax we pay, tax on inheritances, tax on disposals. Tax involves everyone. Um, so if you get a qualification in tax, if you have a degree in tax, you have this range of career options open to you. You can become a solicitor who specialises in it. You can become a barrister who specialises in it. You may go work with one of the large accountancy firms and either you may decide to do the accounting exams or not and just be uh, to stick with the tax qualification. If you're working sort of in a legal firm or an accounting firm as a tax specialist, your clients will be high net worth individuals. They will be large multinational companies. I started my career in KPMG and the companies I worked on were companies the likes of Pennies, the like Fife's, uh, Icon PLC, um, the Goodman companies. It used to be great fun every year when the rich list would get published and you'd be looking through to say, I've dealt with them. I work, I've work. i worked on some of their cases. So working with really interesting um, businesses and people. But you're not limited to that. There are jobs in the public sector. So a friend of mine who's one of my you know, tax uh, friends is working for the HSE. Um, others work with, think, with international organisations like the OECD. And there are many, many jobs with the revenue commissioners. And even throughout uh, austerity, they're one of the employers, public sector employers, who are still able to continue recruiting. So there's a huge array of jobs out there. And although the tax you will learn will be based around the Irish legislation, it is much more international than you'd expect. And it can be used, having an Irish tax qualification will allow you work abroad because there are certain key principles in tax that are similar no matter where you are. And as you qualify as a tax uh, practitioner, a tax specialist and work in it, a lot of the tax becomes international tax. And that can be used um, in many countries, but particularly as with law, with the English speaking common law countries such the US, the UK, Australia, New Zealand. But it's not just limited to that. Lisa, go on to the next slide. So I was asked a question that comes up sometimes with students in relation to this degree is, well, what is tax? And I know some people automatically think of tax as something bad. It's just a payment you make. It's that square on the Monopoly board where you have to pay over the 200, uh, you, whatever the currency is, a monopoly that you've just got for pass and go. But there's a quote from, it's a US Supreme Court case from 1927 where Supreme Court Justice there, Oliver Wendell Holmes said, taxes are what we pay for civilized society. And that's, that's the key thing. That's actually why I love tax. Everything we do in society, how our societies operate through our nation states, depend so much on taxes. So the key role or purpose of taxes is obviously to raise revenue. And those revenues are then used to fund our universities, to pay the teachers that you have now, to pave the roads, to pay for the policing, for the court system, for the social welfare system. Everything the government does, is practically everything, is financed from our taxes. So tax has this such an integral role to how society works. Now it has subsidiary roles as well. So we use it also for the redistribution of wealth, which is why we have higher tax rates, the more, the more income people have, so that that money can be used to help those who are less privileged. We use taxes to reprice goods and services. You might have heard the phrase sin taxes. We brought in sugar taxes a few years ago to try and discourage people from buying certain items, the high sugar drinks, so that to change behaviour rather than to raise revenue. And we also use taxes to incentivise other goods or services. So we give tax breaks to certain industries to encourage them to undertake activity. And I see that many of you may have seen the last couple of days, there's a trailer going around of a film with the most horrendous Irish accents you've ever heard, The Wild Mountain Pine. 
And that, in making that uh, movie, there were tax breaks given, effectively uh, paid, for, partially paid for by the Irish taxpayer to encourage the making of movies. Maybe next time we'll have to put something into the tax legislation with clauses about how they portray us. Tax is also important in representation. And that might seem like, what do you mean by representation? But when people pay taxes, they feel more involved and more, more part of the decisions business makes. So often when you hear people giving out about something a decision government make, they may talk about how this impacts on taxpayers. And that's all of us, not just those who are paying income taxes. And there's lots of research done on that, on how people feel more involved. And part of the history of taxes is how we've seen where you know taxes have don't necessarily have the best history. They tended to be raised by kings and other leaders to finance the, their wars, basically. But as taxes started to be raised, once people were paying taxes, they were able to demand certain rights from their from the government or the ruler in that case. And there is that sort of strong link that when you pay taxes, you feel involved. And then also it kind of gets used as political signaling. Sometimes we have taxes that are there that never really do anything, but it's a way for government to say, we've done something. We've put a tax in or we've put in a tax incentive and it shows we're caring. So tax policy is used sometimes to support other policies. And um, Donald Trump recently was using tax policy, um, in this case, trade taxes or tariffs as a way to influence the relationship with China. So effectively, it was using taxes as part of foreign policy, which is really a bad idea. But when you get to study tax, and lots of what you'll study is, is more the detailed rules, it still gives you the opportunity to think about this. Why this tax? Why a particular relief? What are we doing this for? And what is the impact of that? So the last slide there, Lisa. OK, uh, so then hopefully you can, I was getting a bit of a spooling there. I'm in rural Offaly, so my Internet's not the best. The attributes needed, all the ones Connor talked about in relation to a law, being a law student, they still apply for. And again, I had to see the slide. So the, the first one overlaps very clearly. You know, I, I I hummed and hawed about the phrasing there. I say strong reading skills. It's more about language and it's it's about being able to go read something that can be quite dense at times when you're reading legislation um, and quite, you know, formalized. I mean, able to read that and pick through it, put in the time and work out the meaning. You'll be reading case law. You'll be reading tax treaties. You'll be reading contracts. So the picture there at the side then is the tax legislation in our some of the tax legislation in Ireland, and that's the, the starting point. But as I said, tax law also um, comes from case law, from treaties and so forth. Because it's this overlap between tax and account or accounting and law, you need to be comfortable with numbers. So there are a good number of accounting modules, but accounting isn't difficult maths. You do not need to be a tax genius by any stretch. I would not have had a career in tax and I worked 17 years before I came back to work to teach in NUI Galway. <laughs> you don't have to be a tax genius. You don't need honours level maths. You just need to be comfortable working with numbers and looking at numbers and uh, dealing with them. So the maths you do in tax work is really, you do want a simple calculator. You don't need even a scientific one. But some people have a, have a bit of a mental block about numbers. If that's you, tax isn't for you. But if you're OK with numbers, that's fine. And then I would say you need to be details focused. And I think this applies to a lot of law as well as the language. You nearly need to be pedantic, but particularly for tax law. There is so much legislation and it, it doesn't all bind well together. The different taxes can sometimes contradict each other and the rules that apply to them. So that ability to spend a lot of time looking through the legislation and working out exactly what it means and applying it to your client circumstances is a really key skill in it. Um, but I would say, you know, the idea of deciding you're specialising in tax this young, if you decided you chose this course and then you decided tax wasn't for you, it isn't lost learning. I said it will apply to whatever business and area you go into. 
But if you do stick with it, um, what I loved about tax was you were dealing with, um, I was always dealing with such interesting clients. I loved reading the legislation. I loved picking through it. And oh, a benefit I found for me was, unlike some of the scenarios discussed by Connor, I wasn't dealing with life or death situations. So although it was really intellectually challenging um, and quite interesting, if I messed up or if I lost something in a dispute with the revenue, whatever, nobody died. It was only ever money that was at stake. So that's actually can be a benefit. Not, not all of us have the temperament required to deal with things like right to, the, to life and like uh, right to die cases and the like. So the other thing I would say, just to finish up, is I would never recommend anyone pick a course based entirely on what salaries you get at the other end. But if you do decide to go with tax, it is very much a growing area. There are lots of jobs and they're very well paid, um, which can be encouraging. And taxes apply in recessionary times as well as boom times. So they, it's not overly, uh, the supply of jobs isn't overly determined by how well the economy is doing at a particular time. So that's my very short run through of tax and, and why it's so exciting and you should care about it. Um, please pop in some questions into the chat and I'd be delighted to answer them. Hello everyone, um, we'll now start um, answering some of your questions. Um, we have a panel um, ready to start answering some of your questions. So those who are joining me to help answer some of the questions. Um, if you could turn on your cameras just so that we can see everyone and I'll introduce you all. Yeah, so um, we have um, Eve O'Connor, she's a final year um, of the Law BCL and she's joining us to talk a little bit about her experience. Um, I don't see her yet, but I'm sure she'll probably hopefully share her um, camera in a minute with us. Um, we also have. Um, Do I have Hi, Eve. I, I, I see you now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. We also have Larissa Lam, um, our study abroad and work placement officer. We have um, Deirdre Burns, um, lecturer in legal Irish, sorry, in legal German. And we also have um, Dorothy, a lecturer in legal. Irish and then we have um, Connor and Mary who you've already met so we're all on hand to answer any questions that you have and I've given a look through all the questions that have come in and a, a really burning question that we keep getting asked is um, what are the entry requirements for our law courses so the entry requirements for the law BCL um, law and human rights and law and criminology is um, two subjects with a H5 or higher and then also you need um, passes and four other subjects. And then for our law and taxation and our um, law and business programme, you need to have a pass in maths as well. So maths is not an entry requirement for the other ones, but it is for law and taxation and law and business. And then another burning question that I, I've seen that we've got asked um, lots in the chat is, um, what is the difference between our BA with, uh, with law programme and our law BCL? So I might pass you over to Connor, who will explain the difference between our law course and our um, BA with law. Uh, thanks for that, Lisa. Um, the difference is, is, a, a, is, is about context, I guess. Uh, in in the, the BA law programme, you get to study law, but within a broader humanities context. So. Uh, in my case, when I, I took that program many, many years ago, um, I got to study law along with English, uh, sociology and politics and history. At the time, you had to take four subjects in first year and then you dropped two of them. So, and, and I proceeded to degree level uh, studying law and history. So that's that's it, that's one of the great uh, benefits of, of that particular program. You get this much broader perspective um, which influences uh, how you see the law, because the law doesn't operate in a vacuum. It is influenced by other disciplines. It influences other disciplines. There's a lot of interplay. 
Uh, so through the BA program, you, you could combine the study of law with things like economics or with philosophy, for example, obviously with languages, all of which will enrich your study of the law. While also, of course, uh, between the BA program and the LLB program, which is graduates of the BA law program, go directly into the final year of the LLB. Between the two, you will cover all of the required legal subjects uh, to, to qualify professionally. So it's a full law program, just with this broader context. Whereas the BCL is designed for people who want to study law and pretty much stick with the law and maximize the amount of, of um, of legal knowledge that they can accumulate while in, while in college. Uh, that's, I guess, that's the downside of, of taking a, a, the, the, the law through the BA. You spend half your time on, a, on another discipline, which obviously reduces the amount of legal modules that you can take. Um, there's no right or wrong uh, between the two. There's no right choice, no wrong choice, no good choice, no bad choice. It really depends on what you want to do and what your interests are. Um, in, in my case, it, it was a great choice. I love history. I've always loved history. Uh, as, alongside my interest in the criminal law, I have an interest in legal history. So I managed to link the two directly. Um, other people, you might, might prefer just to, to focus on studying law, and that's fine too. There's no right or wrong issue. It's just whatever suits you, your career plans, your interests, and your abilities, your strengths. Yeah, and I suppose just to clarify, a lot of people have been asking questions about how long is the BA with law degree, and you can do that either three years or four years. If you do the four-year option, you can do study abroad, whereas if you do the three-year option, you don't have study abroad. So if you do the three years of the Bachelor of Arts with law, and you can then do one year over LLB, so essentially you have a full law degree in four years for those asking. So the LLB is typically three years, but because you've already covered a lot of law modules in your BA with arts, um, you'll actually um, skip into final year of the LLB. So I hope that makes sense. It can be quite um, confusing um, to, to, to understand sometimes. And Eve, um, while I have you on, on screen, um, it would be great if um, you could tell us a little bit about I suppose, your study abroad experience last year in France. Yeah, um, so I took French for, and I'm taking it this year, so um, I take legal French as part of my degree. Um, so I got to go to the south of France last year on my Erasmus. I was in Aix-en-Provence, it's near Marseille. Um, so I had an absolutely fantastic year. And yeah, as I think everyone has said before, um, it's just such a brilliant opportunity. It really takes you out of, I suppose, the library for a year and just, you know, you meet so many new people, you have so many new experiences. Um, and I think I, well, I studied through French as well, so I thought that was really worthwhile. Um, and it just, you know, there's nothing that's better for your language either. So if you like French or German or whatever language it is you take in school, I definitely recommend taking it then in the degree if you can. Um, even if for the study abroad and just for that extra skill, I think it's it's really incredible. Yeah, and, and I suppose um, work placement and and study abroad is an option year three, so you only get to pick one, but you actually got to do some work placement as well. Um, you secured an internship for the summer, so if you could tell us a little bit about how you managed to secure that, that would be great. Yeah, um, I did an internship with Arthur Cox in June, the um, the June before I went um, on Erasmus. Um, so you'll notice when you're in, particularly when you're in second year, from second year on, um, those recruiters will be around the university all the time. Um, so, you know, they really, like they want law students like all the time. So, you know, they'll, they all run these events and everything. So I applied through Arthur Cox then. And um, yeah, it was great. And, you know, it was really interesting. It wasn't really something I considered before um, corporate law. And I thought it was a really great opportunity to do it. It was a month long and in Dublin and they paid for accommodation for people not from Dublin, which I thought was, you know, it really made it accessible. Um, and yeah, it was just a great experience and great to have that so that I could get the opportunity of the work experience as well as the study abroad. So yeah, yeah it was really yeah. the best of both worlds. Yeah, because I think some students in third year, they want to do both and they're torn between the two. So it's a good way of doing both to do your study abroad and then look for 
mm. a summer internship so it's a really good example and am I right in saying you've actually secured a job from your summer internship yeah yeah I had a job offer then at the end so again that was fantastic then to be able to be in France for the year already having the security yeah. of the job offer so yeah I really felt like I got lucky with that one so yeah. I'd very recommend Great. that as well. Thanks Eve. Um, and just I suppose there's a lot of questions um, coming in on how long does it take to become a barrister or a solicitor so Connor I might pass that one over to you please. Yep. Um, <sighs> Okay, how long will it take? Let's assume you have your law degree. Starting from that point, if you want to be a solicitor, uh, there's a couple of things you have to do. Uh, firstly, you, you have to secure um, an apprenticeship with a law firm. Essentially, you, you have to find someone who's willing to take you on and train you uh, because a, a big part of the, the training of a solicitor is actually in the firm. Uh, you're learning by doing. There's also two uh, periods of study in, in the Law Society. It'll take, um, I, th I think the, the, the program is about two years, just under two years now. You also have to pass a set of entrance exams known as the FE1s. Um, so realistically, give yourself a, a chance to pass the FE1s, um, you know, six months to 12 months, and then you do your apprenticeship after that. There may be a delay in starting your apprenticeship, uh, it's not unusual for, for somebody to secure an apprenticeship and not start it for maybe another six months or another 12 months. So the, the total period of time could be three years, could be four years, depending on um, the, the particular circumstances. To be a barrister, again, you've got entrance exams uh, to, to get into the King's Inns. Um, then the program of study is either one year full time or two years part time. Uh, at the end of that process, of course, there'll be exams. Uh, you pass the exams, you'll be you'll be called to the bar by the chief justice. It's a it's an amazing ceremony, um, and even then, you're you're a barrister, but you can't start yet. You have to take at least one year of um, uh, it's essentially an, an apprenticeship. It's called deviling. Uh, you you find yourself a an experienced barrister who will show you the ropes, introduce you to solicitors. You'll make some contacts. <clears throat> you'll get some some basic experience and then you're out on your own. Uh, so it could be two years, could be three years. A um, lot more exams, a lot more study, either way, uh, whichever route you go. But you're looking at, you know, certainly, I, th I think it'd be fair to say uh, uh, three years on average for whichever route you take. Yeah, that's perfect. And um, a lot of students are, are writing in, um, will I be able to work in America? Can I become a barrister abroad. So they're really, I suppose, asking, um, can, can they go and practice abroad? Um, the answer is it, it, it depends on where you want to go. Um, every, every country, uh, every jurisdiction has its own rules. Uh, you mentioned America. Every state is a different jurisdiction. Essentially, every state is a country in itself. They have their own bar association, uh, which set their own rules. At present, as of now, uh, the New York uh, bar authorities are, are fairly um, generous in terms of uh, recognizing a, a law degree from an English speaking country, from a common law country. That, of course, can change. But as of now, they do recognize full law degrees <coughs> as qualifying you to sit, the, uh, sit their bar exam. Other states, most other states, will require a, a common law degree plus maybe one year, sometimes more, in an American law school, maybe an LLM study in, in an American law school. <clears throat> so it depends on which state you want to go to. And the same is true in any other country. Uh, each country is going to have its own rules. I will say, however, that our graduates have gone on uh, to qualify professionally and to work professionally in a variety of countries. We have, we have several in, in America, in Canada, in Australia, and of course lots in, in um, England and in Northern Ireland. So the route is there, um, it just the, 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 the precise requirements will vary. Okay, brilliant. Um, Dorothy or Deirdre, um, with a couple of questions on languages, if you'd like to come on and um, turn on your camera, maybe one of you might um, answer. 
I'm, I'm not too sure if you're there. Yep, I'm here, um, Lisa. T thanks, Deirdre. Um, I, I don't know if everybody can see me. <laughs> I can see you. <laughs> um, are there specific questions, Lisa? Yeah, so one of the questions um, that came in was just about studying languages when you get to um, university. Yeah. Um, they'd like to know, I thought, how good do you need to be at speaking and reading the language that you want to study? OK, that's a very good question. Um, and I really can only speak for legal German here. Um, just to say that it's very, very different to uh, secondary school. What we do in um, the course in all three years is different. Um, I would say for German, uh, H5 um, would be important in a higher level. And if you have that, you won't have any problems in keeping up with the course at all. Um, I can put in a link to my course in the chat if you want in a moment, but um, I certainly wouldn't um, worry that you wouldn't be able to keep up or anything like that. That has never been my experience so far with students. OK, brilliant. And I suppose we also have the option um, of beginner's German on our course as well for yeah. Yeah, so very student, absolutely. Yeah, so that's for complete beginners, not for people who have already done it in school. Um, so that's absolutely the basics. And then if you do well in first year, you can join with the advanced class in second year. And that's um, common enough that happens as well each year. You'd have one or two students who would do that. So, yeah, absolutely. That's brilliant. Thanks, Deirdre. Okay. And um, Larissa, um, if you're there, you can turn on your camera. Um, we've had a couple of questions on study abroad and work placement. Yes, I'm here, Lisa. Can you see me OK? Yeah, I can. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, I suppose, first of all, um, I suppose if you could tell us a little bit about um, the support that students receive in, in advance of professional work placement and how they can go about seeking their professional work placement and securing um, a placement in your tree. Yes, definitely. So when students decide that they want to do a professional work placement, they will be working very closely with uh, their placement officer. So we will be doing um, a range of seminars. So a lot of CV preparation interview skills will be completed and a lot of one to one and coaching sessions with uh, each student. So they will uh, receive a lot of support to succeed at the interview and then secure a placement. Brilliant, thanks. And um, just in study abroad, um, a lot of students are asking, um, can you give an indication on maybe perhaps what the cost might be? Yeah, it, it really varies uh, according to the destination, but it is important to mention that students won't be paying fees when they go abroad, and that's really, really good because some universities would definitely be quite expensive, especially in the US. So it, it can vary a little bit, but it is important to, especially now when it's so far ahead, to start budgeting for flights, accommodations, and just general expenses, really. So I would say if students are really, really um, interested in going to the US or Canada, that can be maybe a bit expensive. They can start planning and budgeting and just really considering those expenses that will be involved. And if they're going, in the EU, then they can avail of the Erasmus grant, which is not much, but definitely helps with uh, accommodation expenses and the flight as well. Brilliant. T thanks, Larissa. That's great. And um, Connor, we've got a good few questions on um, careers. Um, one student specifically asked, um, can I go on to become a, a, a journalist? And we actually have one of our graduates um, working for the Irish Times, I believe, Harry McGee. I'm correct in saying that, aren't I, Connor? Um, Connie, you might turn on your microphone, sorry. <laughs> God, I hate these buttons. Uh, they are so not kind to me today. Uh, apologies. Um, yes, we do. Harry McGee is, is, is one of ours. Uh, in, in a manner of speaking, uh, law is a, is a, it's a great preparation for, for journalism. Um, because so much of what journalists do, especially those in in the you know current affairs and and political uh, sections, so much of what they do is law related and built on law. Um, so it's it's almost an ideal foundation for somebody who wants to go into that. Certainly, those areas of journalism, 
Um, there, there will be more work to do afterwards. There are postgraduate qualifications in journalism uh, afterwards. But I should also say that the transferable skills that, that we're focusing on developing are the kind of skills that will go down extremely well in, a, in, a, in the area of journalism. The ability to identify issues, to, to uh, problem solve, to analyze and assimilate a large amount of information and to be able to simplify it to be able to communicate effectively. These are skills that journalists must have, and these are exactly the kind of skills that, that we focus on developing in, in all of our law programs. That's great. Um, thanks, Connor. And um, I suppose just to touch on um, Le Legal Irish, um, it, it's a new module now offered on all of our five law programs, and um, Dorothy is with us today. So, um, Dorothy, if you're there, you, you might like to come on and turn on your camera and maybe um, tell us a little bit about um, the option for um, students who study legal Irish in year three. Yeah, um, can you hear me, Lisa? Yeah, I, I can. Thanks, can. Dorothy. Here. Yeah. OK, all right. Yeah, I know we're delighted to be involved with the law degrees and I suppose our third year is slightly different. Um, our students will all get um, a semester in the Gaeltot and we were talking there about expenses, but we're lucky that there is a, a Gaeltot grant so the students will have full accommodation and food and everything for 400 euro. So <laughs> this should encourage people to come our way. Um, and in fact, um, we've been running uh, the Grail semester with the BA and the BCom for a few years now, and, and students have really, really enjoyed it and benefited from it. And then we're hoping then, well, we'll be working towards this. There will be work experience in the second semester. And what we're working with, again, with the Department of the Grail we're hoping to get internships for some of our students in the European institutions and maybe in the European um, Court of Justice, because I suppose in the area of Irish, and maybe some people are not aware of this, but there are an awful lot of jobs for lawyer linguists. I'm not sure if Deirdre touched on that because my link went, but um, Irish is, is, is in great demand within the European institutions. So doing a degree in Irish and law is, um, is I think it's very attractive. And um, I, I suppose as well, domestically as well, we do need lawyers and solicitors who can deal with clients um, through the Irish language. So, yeah, we're delighted to be involved with this. Um, this isn't our first involvement. We've, you know, we've had links with the um, School of Law before, but certainly third year, we're looking forward to it. We're looking forward to having our students and working with the, um, the institutions to set up the um, internships. That, that's great. Thanks, Dorothy, because I think a lot of students um, think that there's no international students, um, international opportunities with, with studying legal Irish, but there actually is. You can work as um, an EU um, lo lawyer um, yeah. with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah no, uh, and they are actually at the moment, I think they're recruiting, I think it's up to 120, you know, so <laughs> there are big opportunities. And again, yeah. I think Mary said that you don't want to think about money, but they are very well paid jobs if, yeah. if, you, if you're in, if you want to go that route. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks, um, Dorothy. Um, I think we're just almost um, out of time, unfortunately, and there's still lots of questions coming in. But um, just I suppose one final question, um, Connor, before we go. And I, I will put um, an email in the chat function if we missed any of your questions and um, feel free to um, email us. But Connor, I suppose um, for students who are wondering, um, is law the right choice for me? Um, what would you say to them? And maybe and perhaps, perhaps they, they might also be thinking, um, which law course should I choose? What advice would you give them? <coughs> um. It's, it's very hard to answer that. That's that's a really hard question to answer. Um, a, a, a lot is going to depend on the attributes that, that the individual has. Uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, there's an awful lot of reading to be done. So if you really don't like reading, then, you know, probably law is not a great option for you. If you don't like the idea of problem solving, of, of developing the kind of skills, if that's not what you're interested in, the kind of skills I mentioned, law is probably not for you. Um, but I think most, from, from my experience, most people have an interest in law. They have an interest in how the legal system works, and that carries you a long way. Um, all skills get better through, through time and through practice, and, and you know, legal skills, language skills are no different. 
uh, and you will have the opportunity to do those kind of skills. So I think the fundamental issue is, are you interested in the law? Are you interested in how society and our state regulates itself and, and how we regulate our behavior vis-a-vis uh, -vis each other? If those are of, of uh, interest to you, is, is justice in, uh, of interest to you? Is justice tends to be regulated through legal mechanisms. If that's of interest to you, then that's a really good foundation. Uh, 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 an enjoyment of language, of using language, uh, that's a, a good indicator that, that law might be for you. Uh, you often hear people say, uh, well, you know, especially parents, well, my, my daughter is, is argumentative, she'd be a great lawyer. That actually doesn't follow. That doesn't follow. A, a, a lawyer is somebody who, who does a lot more than just argue. And even when they do argue, they argue in a, in a particular way, drawing on a, a particular set of skills that they begin to learn in law school. So I, I think probably interest is number one. Number two is, is a, an ability with language and an enjoyment of language. Um, number three is uh, in, enjoying communicating. Because a lot of law is about communication, both verbal and written. So I think those are probably the three best attributes that, that indicate uh, somebody who would do well in the law. Um, I, I also mentioned in the in the presentation that there's no particular set of subjects that, that a would-be lawyer will take. Uh, all subjects develop certain skills. They will all bring something to the table. They'll all help fashion the individual. Um, even if it's not immediately apparent. I gave the example of the Chief Justice, who, who is a mathematician by training. Uh, he, 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 he didn't take the kind of subjects uh, and disciplines that one normally associates with lawyers. He, he went down the mathematics route. Um, but yet, there he is. He's the Chief Justice. He's the premier lawyer in the country. So um, it doesn't really matter what subjects you're taking. It matters more your interests in, in the law and the legal process and, and your interest and ability with language. I think those are those are the, the, the core attributes. That, that's great. Um, and which I, program, sorry, you also asked which program, that yeah. really depends entirely on the individual, on, on where your particular interests lie and what your career plans are. Pick the one that is most appropriate to you. They're all full law programs. They're just different routes to the same point. That's great. Um, Thanks, Connor. Um, so I'm afraid that's all we have time for questions. Um, I'd like to thank all my panel who have joined me and helped um, present and answer questions. It's much appreciated. And I'll pop an email into the chat. Um, for those of you who we didn't get to answer your question, for, um, I'll pop um, an email in the chat now so you can ask um, your question to us by email, perhaps. Um, and I'd like to pass you over to Caroline Duggan, who is going to close the information even this evening. Thanks, Lisa. Um, thank you so much to everyone who joined us tonight, um, particularly those who've given up their Thursday evening to be with us and asked loads of questions. We're absolutely delighted to see you. questions and whether you're doing your research and you're really thinking um, about what course you want to put down on that CAO form. So we're delighted to see that engagement and that interaction and both the College of Business and the School of Law and indeed Shannon will pop emails now into the chat function. So if you still have a question that you know you didn't get answered or you hadn't thought about the time, please take down the emails. They'll only be too delighted to answer any of those questions for you and the same for a comment accommodation and for sport. So just to, to remind you that tonight was the first in a series of four information evenings that we're holding. So our next one will be on the 19th of November, again from 7 to 9 p.m. That will be for the College of Science and Engineering. We will have then a follow up on the 26th of November for the College of Arts, Social Science and Celtic Studies. And then our last one will be on the 3rd of December for the College of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences. And the 
format will be very similar. So we will have academics, we'll have uh, industry partners, um, and we'll have students and alumni from the different colleges. So if you're interested in attending any of those, uh, you can register online at nuigoway.ie forward slash CAO events. So that's all for this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. And just remember to take down those emails if you have any other questions that you want um, answered. So thank you so much.